Good evening, and welcome to the virtual open house for the Davenport Greenway Project. My name is Susan Walsh. I'm the Director of Community Engagement uh, for Toronto for Go Expansion Projects at Metrolinx. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this evening's event. As you are looking at your screen, you'll note the event is being closed captioned. You can turn on closed captioning by clicking the CC icon button on your video player. It will, um, we've scheduled the meeting to last 1.5 hours, 90 minutes. Um, we're going to start with the land acknowledgement and safety moment, and then we'll hear from our elected officials, followed by a brief presentation, and afterwards we'll take questions, both from two sources tonight. One's that there's been a, a virtual open house site going for almost two weeks, so there's a lot of questions there, and plus then there's some more on the live site, so we'll be drawing for both. I'm going to start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the tra traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Moving on to our safety moment. First of all, we were going to plan to do one on ice and snow, but hey, we don't have any, so yay. Um, instead, I was thinking that today would be a good day to remind those of us who are 50 and over that you can book your um, COVID booster shot as of today. Um, I booked mine on Shoppers Drug Mart, not a problem at all, Got, and have a, an appointment on Friday afternoon. Not that it's all about me, but it's if you're having any problems, I don't know about the government site, but you can get in there easily. On January 4th, those that are 18 and up will be able to book. And of course, we still have first shots available for those 5 to 11. And I'm excited to see the number of friends that say that their kids and grandkids have gotten their shot in that 5 to 11 um, air, uh, bucket of people. I shouldn't call them a bucket. But anyway, um, so that um, being said, be safe and uh, and be careful as we move forward to another tough time where we're going to have some more cases that are coming out. Um, on our agenda, um, the I'll, we're about to move to presentations, but you know what? First, I'm going to call on um, Deputy Mayor Anna Balau to give us some um, brief remarks right off the top, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Thanks, Susan. And thank you to all the residents that are joining us here today. I think that we're all very pleased to be here. I know um, that, you know, there was some anxiety uh, in the community, let's be honest, when we saw the project being tender for the Davenport Diamond and not having the public realm included created some anxiety and some concern in the community. And so it's very good to see this moving forward, the design moving forward, um, and, and to have, um, to be honest with you, architects working on the design that are very familiar with our community, that are very familiar with projects that have been similar to our community that are very dear to us, like the West Toronto Rail Path, so I see Kim here. So Kim, is great to have you on board. We know that you know this community well. You know that you understand um, the vision that we have for this project. And um, <clears throat> we've had several meetings already around Smart Track, and I explained this, that, you know, when, when this whole project came uh, um, to, to our community, we really wanted to ensure that this was not only a transit project, but it was a city building project and that we were going to take the opportunity to connect communities that had been uh, separated, that we were going to have the opportunity to ensure that we're not going to have spaces that we're not inviting, but actually create amazing public spaces. And if this pandemic has shown us something is actually the importance of good public spaces and taking advantage of every little bit that we have in a growing city like us. So here we are having a very important transit project being built, but at the same time, ensuring that the commitment that Metrolinx did to this community, that this was not going to only going to be a project with train that was going to make trains pass by our community 
that it was going to translate into a project that was going to benefit the community as a whole. Those that use the transit, but all those that live beside these lanes, these lines as well. And that's what the guideway is all about, is creating public spaces, is ensuring that these are safe, welcoming, amazing spaces in our community as well. So very excited to see the design here, to continue to have feedback, to have our city staff continue to work with Metrolinx to ensure that this is a, sp a, a space that is going to be uh, a great addition to our community and complementary and connected to the amazing West Frontal Rail Path that we already have. So thank you all for your contribution. Looking forward to staying here with you and hearing from you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so we're about to move on to the presentation, but some quick guidance first. You'll be able to follow along with the presentation on your screen. We'll make it a lot bigger, I promise. Um, but you can also click um, the presentation materials link um, and below and download it for your later reference. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see that a number of people have already submitted written questions. We ask you to take a look and uh, scroll through. So there's two places, as I mentioned, that they will have uh, provided questions. One was on the static screen that we've had going for the past two weeks and also this live screen as well. I'm not suggesting you have to go through both, but if you see a question that's that looking very much like what you want to ask, then you know that it's going to be covered and perhaps vote that up. Um, so we're going to start with the questions that have had the most votes. Uh, if you prefer to ask a live question, you can join the Zoom room and ask questions verbally. So you click on the yellow uh, join Zoom button to join. My amazing colleague, colleague, Colin Burns, will be moderating the Zoom room. Colin will recognize you when you raise your hand in the Zoom room and he'll turn on your microphone. We ask that you um, ask one question at a time. Um, and you can also provide written questions in the Zoom room as well, and he'll read those out. Um, so we may not get to all of the questions, but in um, we will put written answers for every written question uh, that we have in, on either location. So our, again, if you've just joined us, this meeting is being closed captioned. You can turn on the closed captioning by clicking on CC icon on your video player. I'd like you to introduce uh, to introduce you to our panel this evening. First, from Metrolinx, John Potter, Manager of Design Standards. Brown and Story Architects, Kim Story, Architect Principal Urban Design and Architect Lead. Lisa McTaggart, Landscaped Architect, Landscaped Architect Lead. I, I, maybe you can help, never mind, I'm not going to try to pick your brain. Um, Lorraine Johnston, editor, writer and educator, native plant and pollinator expert, public education. And Josh Fullen, director of community engagement lead, Maxim City, which is a, a company that's affiliated also that works a lot with Brown and Story. So that is our, those are our experts. And so let's turn this over to, uh, we'll go to our slide um, five please, and I'll call upon John Potter to start. Yeah. Hi, and uh, welcome everybody. I just, uh, I thought I would start the presentation before handing it off to Kim and company to take you through the development of the Greenway Projects design or give you an update by just, uh, you know, talking about the guideway project that's currently under construction. So as you know, everyone in the community knows that construction's moving a pace, but I I pulled together a bunch of images just to kind of show you that what, you know, you're all familiar with the work on the abutments for the new bridges and the columns, but there is a lot of other work happening in tandem, which you're not seeing. And part, some of them are the, the manufacturing of the concrete spans for the guideway and others are the, you know, the noise barrier that also defines the identity of the guideway, you know, when, you know, once it's constructed. But I picked these images because I've, the rendering you see here, which is taken from the Brown Story uh, presentation that you'll see, clearly shows the, the design for the columns, the elevated guideways with the opening in the middle, this the noise barrier with the kind of reflective coating or reflective surface to kind of help minimize the visual impact of the structure by ha allowing for 
you know, life and reflection and also, you know, background matching more or less with the sky beyond. But here you see the formwork for the columns, which most everyone here will have walked by. Uh, the lower left hand corner is a series of images of the noise barrier or no, the cladding mock-ups that we inspected. We put a lot of effort into the detailing of this component of the guideway. And then on the lower right, you see one of the spans coming out of the manufacturing facility that will be, I think, starting installation on site fairly shortly. And you can sort of see from that image that, you know, there's a lot of thought. The project delivery team has been working really hard to make sure that the requirements we put into our output spec are delivered because, you know, the quality of the design of this bridge requires that we deliver the product, you know, as per spec. So next um, slide, this the next slide is really just a introduction to the Greenway project. And um, Brandon's story will be continuing to work on the design and tender documents to, uh, for this part of the Davenport Diamond project until summer 2022. But really what this is about, and this is something that, you know, Councillor Bilal mentioned is right today you have a rail corridor that's fenced off and inaccessible and has created a, a barrier between two sides of the neighborhood that stretches back nearly a century. What the guideway, pro, the elevated guideway does is uh, opens up that space both below and beside the, the rail tracks and provides us with an opportunity to create a public amenity, a multi-use trail where, you know, adjacent to the bermed areas of the guideway and then under the elevated sections, you know, we've opened the new, sp new space that allows for both sides of the community to seamlessly connect both at day one, but also it allows for the evolution of um, more connections over time as the community and the private you know, landowners adjacent to the guideway project start to recognize the opportunities and take advantage of them. Anyway, with this, I'm going to hand it off to Kim, who will be taking you through the Davenport Diamond Greenway project. That... Hey, thanks, John. It's actually Josh. I'm going to. Oh, Here's sorry, this. Josh. Apologies. No, no worries. Thank you, John. Uh, I am just going to set the stage uh, for the designers presentations. Welcome, everyone, on behalf of the Brown and Story team. I want to thank you for your participation. We are certainly eager to show you uh, the design work thus far. Uh, and as the deputy mayor said, this is a community we know well and certainly value and uh, are a part of. So I want to start just by showing a context slide, and that's um, the one that follows this one here. Um, sorry, it's the next one. I apologize. Here we go. So what, what I like about this slide here is it really shows the work that the Greenway does um, to stitch together sort of the different um, public amenities and parks along sort of the linear length uh, of the project. So you'll see right along there how it does the work of pulling together these spaces that were quite disparate and separated um, initially. And the second thing that is useful here to recognize is how the connection points are visualized. So those blue circles and semicircles, they indicate um, sort of the, the formal new and enhanced connection points, the east-west connection points. But there's also sort of a broader theme of connectivity um, that I think is important to recognize as well when you think of sort of the existing condition in Campbell Avenue Park, for example, where there is a fence along the eastern perimeter, you'll now be able to sort of seamlessly transition uh, into the landscaping and the space under the guideway and then the multi-use trail. So all of this is sort of the important work uh, that the Greenway does to pull all those th different things together. And the connection points we really see as changing the sort of the, the daily experience on the ground for people who are moving by bike, by uh, by foot, by transit. This really changes um, how you will go places and and how you will connect to different places in the community. So, so we really see this as an important thing to illustrate before we get into the designs. Uh, and, and the next the next slide sort of speaks to the design drivers. And these were part of an earlier presentation. 
So I'm not going to dwell on them, but I, I think what's important to point out here is if you go back to uh, the residence reference panel that uh, was conducted by Mass LEP in 2016, they established, that group actually established uh, project values. And if you line up these design drivers to their project values, you'll see that most of them are basically synonymous. So the DNA of the design really comes from the record of community consultation uh, that was established over several years of, of work in the community. Um, you know, for example, the, we have um, we have one of the design drivers as links. We just spoke to all the connections and connectivity that is taking place, uh, and that goes well back to the reference, <laughs> reference panel that We're established have to be... connectivity as one of the key values for the project. Um, so I just wanted to point out that those that these dr design drivers are really iterative work based on the DNA um, that was informed by the community at the outset of the consultation. And then the next slide is um, Kim's to sort of launch from, but I just want to point out that what you'll see in the next series of slides uh, is divided into three parts. We have the urban design elements, we have uh, the landscape and planting, and then we have the connection points. And these slides don't uh, illustrate every moment or every connection point in the project. There's simply not enough space and the in time and the presentation to do that. So if there is, we're going to try to speak to the ones that aren't illustrated. But if you see something, uh, or you, uh, or rather you don't see something that is uh, that you want to ask a question about, we're really happy to speak to that um, in the Q and A session. So there are key moments that are illustrated throughout this series of slides, but not everything. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Kim to speak to the urban design elements. Thank you, Josh. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, as Josh is saying, I'm talking uh, about the urban design elements of this piece. And what's really key about the Greenway for us as a design team was actually to, to think about it as a landscape field for gathering within it rather than a paved service with planters. So we've kind of reversed that idea that you normally can find in very urban areas. So what I'm, so as Josh was saying, I'm working, I'm talking to the urban design elements and uh, Lisa and Lorraine will speak to the landscape elements within the same slide. So this is really a, a very integrated view, which we thought was important to show as, a, as an illustration of the integrated design. So you can see from uh, the numbers on the screen, on the key, we have number one, which is the elevated greenway. And uh, that is, of course, what is under construction right now that John's just telling, him, telling us about. And two is the egress stair. That is the emergency exit stair from, uh, from the... Antler Street. Um, three is our multi-use trail. The multi-use trail is four meters wide uh, along the whole open greenway area, and it's three meters wide when it's running along the MSE wall, which is running from basically Bloor to uh, Wallace Avenue, and then north of DuPont onto the, uh, well, and north of DuPont. So um, we have a, a very generous multi-use multi trail running along there. And four is a signage beacon. And these are kind of high vertical pieces that really give the, the Greenway its own vertical presence. Uh, that was important for us to create things that enclose space. Creating spaces, urban rooms of its own. So beacons are like lit lanterns that are going to be spaced at the important connection point. So at Antler Street, we have a connection that goes into Campbell Park. Uh, and uh, then you can see, uh, obviously, as Josh was saying before, we have a full connection all the way through Campbell Park. So the whole space of Campbell Park gets pulled right to the east of the, the guideway to create, a, I think, a really nice seamless connection. Um, number five is the bench seating. And this is actually a very robust concrete bench that we have used in many other places before. Uh, it's used it, if I can use my hands, it kind of does this along the side so that it actually creates a, a very subtle uh, deterrent to skateboarder. Very important. Um, sorry, and um, could you go back to the slide, please, Dan? 
so that number so the, those benches are are sitting on number seven which is the raft surfaces the, so these surfaces actually dot along and are accessible from the multi-use trail and those will be in different materials running along the length and these become areas for people to sit and gather and have have small events or just relax and it's just a very uh, I think pleasant way of experience, experiencing the landscape. The vine screen, which is a very light screen, which also serves to uh, delineate the, the urban rooms and where we can grow vertical vines so that we again have an enclosure of uh, outdoor rooms. And number nine is the pathways, which runs on the on the west side of the uh, greenway which gives a secondary way through there so we have the MUT which can be very busy and very fast with bicycle riders and the slower um, the slower pathway on the secondary side can we go ahead and slide please this is a typical section through the space so that you have again, the elevated guideway and the egress stair, multi use trail running along there and the signage beacon. The uh, number six and, and pool lights, which I didn't mention the last time, running along here. So we're trying to keep the lights low in the space instead of uh, sort of highway level lighting on the space. So we're working very hard and creating a very, uh, I think, uh, very iconic lighting scheme for this. Uh, the vine screens, again, you can see a shorter one on the left-hand side of your slide. And number seven denotes sort of the, the limit of the space. Can you go ahead and slide? We're looking north towards uh, across DuPont, the DuPont Bridge Square. This is a very important urban room that we've designed that really makes the most of, really one of the most, I think, spectacular spaces along the space where, where you have on uh, looking at the far end of the screen, you have, which is called number two, is the is the pedestrian ramp and cycling ramp that goes all the way up to the upper edge, upper upper level of uh, of the MUT, it goes across the pedestrian bridge, across the CP line, and down from there. This is a very, from that landing there, you can see all the way down the Greenway, you can see both ways down DuPont, and you can also see down line from the other landings of the ramp of the ramp um, again you see the elevated guideway number one um, and then the multi-use trail coming into it and number four is the signage beacon which will be front and center which will really become a landmark we think along dupont street as you're driving along um, and number seven is really the bridge square which becomes a very highly kind of hard it's a hard surface uh, ringed with landscape and which will really become, a, I think, a key gathering point. Avenue, which is still really a, a key square, key outdoor room of, of the space. Um, number eight, you can see the ring, which is what we call a switch. So where we hit important intersections, we have these circular spaces that circle the columns. And in this case, we have land, um, landscape, planting in there um, and so these become really important kind of circular markers along the square as well let me go ahead one slide please again you can see in this section uh as that's looking south from there you can see the different uh, on the bus level you can see the existing road level um, and then number seven you can see how the sidewalks on the south side of dupont are sloping up from where they are right now existing and they slope right up to connect to the greenway on on both sides of the greenway so this is really a key pedestrian connection from uh from the city to the greenway again you have number three which is the whole bridge square which is happening right at that conjunction uh vertical and horizontal connection points it's a real confluence of the whole greenway in the city altogether um i think we could probably go And I think at that point, I can pass this off to uh, Lisa and Lorraine to talk about the landscape. Thanks, Kim. Um, we're really excited to be sharing the plans for the landscaping of the Greenway. And I guess the approach that we've taken from the landscape is very similar to the architecture in that we're, we're thinking of a robust um, landscape. We're using the design drivers to um, inform the way that we develop the landscape plan. So 
one of the design drivers is maximize the green and um, create habitat. And um, the architecture elements are sort of a kit of parts and we're extending that into the landscape, working with nature and the natural processes using the, what Lorraine and I refer to as the toughest of the tough um, in terms of the plant material. Um, next slide, please. So, so how are we going to use a landscape toolbox? So when we were thinking about it, we came up with uh, five different types of landscape tools. Um, the first of these is the meadow. And those are the plants that first colonize a disturbed area um, that's uh, open to the, to, this, to the sun. And uh, these plants can be as high as your shin or uh, way over your head. And, and Lorraine, if you give some examples of the kind of plants that we're hoping to use in this landscape. Yeah, the meadow will be planted with the real sort of pollinator powerhouse plants, like the asters, the golden rods, the sunflowers that attract an incredible diversity and support an incredible diversity of pollinators like bees and butterflies. Um, the next uh, uh, landscape um, is the the glade, and um, this is th these are typically found in the clearings, and and they're a herbaceous material um, that's a little less showy and a little shorter than the the meadow plant but they're still pretty great plants. Yeah, and they're also, I think the glade is the place where um, you'll really ex sort of, where the sensory experience of these plants will be heightened because it's not just, you know, the beauty of the color, but also the, the scents, the smells of plants like wild bergamot, which smells like Earl Grey tea. Um, the next one is the glen. And the glen is, a glen is a narrow valley, and um, so the plants that we're using in this area are very tolerant of changes in moisture level. Um, and so you'll find things like... Well, you'll, you'll find asters again, which in the fall, it's important, you know, to think about pollinators and their needs throughout the growing season. So in the fall, Plants like the asters will support the migrating butterflies, like the monarchs, and the bees provisioning their nests for the for overwintering. Another landscape that we have is the thicket, and and this is densely planted um, shrubs. And the purpose of the thicket is to provide a barrier where we need it, and also to give some winter form, um, and uh, some the, the spectacular colors of the fall. Yeah, and the the nuts and berries that these shrubs produce will not only support the pollinators, but they'll support birds as well. So they'll be winter food for birds. Um, and the last um, landscape type is the grove. And, and this is actually the, the rarest area uh, landscape um, on the on the site. Um, grove is is will be small trees or large shrubs and and along with the thicket um, grove is really important because and and thicket because those trees and shrubs the woody plant material are the first um, food source for pollinator in the spring with with their flowering um, and so the the grove landscape type while rare on the site will be at those special locations along the greenway where we have some space for, for canopy expansion. Yeah, and those trees will, will bloom throughout the season, so they'll provide a lot of beauty. A plant like the redbud tree in the early spring when it's just a burst of pink flowers, and then moving right through to the fall with the sumac and the, the, that incredible red color in the fall. Next slide, please. So each um, landscape type has a particular spot that it's suited to within the cross section of the greenway because we have a unique condition um, created by the overhead guideway. 
and um, the storm water that's being collected on the surface of the guideway and being brought down uh, between the columns. Um, our plan is to fully integrate the use of the storm water into the planting scheme and um, use it as a defining feature. And you can see on this little sketch that the widths of some of the elements can vary depending on um, how much space we need to manage the storm water that the, 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 um, the glen could get a little wider or the glade could get a little wider if we have uh, more room and the, and the thicket and the meadows, they can vary on the um, right hand side where there is no um, shade from the uh, overhead guideway. If I could get to the next slide. Um, so returning to the view of the MUT looking north towards Antler Avenue, um, you can see the, the meadow landscape uh, number, number one along the right hand side. Um, and uh, surrounding uh, the uh, glen under the um, is lower area between the planting, uh, between the columns. And then on either side of that is, is the glade. And the, the glade kind of um, provides a seamless kind of blurring of the line between um, Campbell Park in this, in this case. And you can see the, the other thing that the, the, this planting does is it um, protects the roots of those existing um, Siberian elms within Campbell Park by targeting the, the heavy footfall traffic onto the, that secondary pathway. And so there'll be lots of room for those roots to sort of expand. And when we restore this landscape, we'll, we'll be actually working on improving the soil conditions for those um, Siberian elms. And that kind of um, feeds back into one of our drivers of protect the green. And then I think I'll pass it back to Kim or Josh for to talk further about the connections. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I can see we're at seven o'clock, so I don't want to spend too much time on these, but I've got to have, if I could have the next slide, please. The connections are really gathering together those pieces of the urban, uh, the urban element. beginning of the project. Um, can we go ahead one slide, please? Again, those are uh, the what the, the connections we're actually illustrating tonight are the ones at DuPont and at Campbell Park and at Wallace. But the other uh, the other connections are as critical to the success of the scheme as all the other ones and uh, particularly the ones that at Davenport, where we're going to be connecting with a, a ramp connection for accessibility and for cycling. At uh, the Davenport Village Park, at least uh, we're just developing uh, the grading of that area, so we don't have more information, but we will have that for later presentations. And at uh, Patton Avenue, which is going ahead, and at Wade Avenue, there will be a connection um, and then south of Wade is part of the Bloor Lansdowne project. So that's not part of our scope, but it will become part of the project at one point. So if we can go ahead one slide. When we talk about Wallace Avenue, uh, we still have the, uh, the square there. It's still very important. It's one of the major, uh, it's a major beginning point. This is where we'll have uh, areas for pop-ups, for um, for markets, for things that can happen there on a, on a temporary basis. But it's a it's a space for the public to interpret, and that will still be part of the project for sure. And you can see in this uh, section, we're showing um, that extent from the uh, width of the the Metrolinx property underneath the guideway extending all the way across the across the MUT over to the built face along Wallace Avenue. Can we go ahead to slide please. And you can see sections are very important to see 
the the effect of of the guideway and the greenway on the larger landscape of Campbell Park. It's really uh, quite a expansive park, and we're really happy that we re were able to create such a seamless connection between the edge of Campbell Avenue and all the way over to uh, to the MUT. Uh, I think this is really an important slide to understand what the space of this is. And we think it's really uh, quite important around the Siberian Elms in particular because there's a very kind of trampled area around the road. By having the secondary path on our side, on, on the Greenway side, with completely open, no fences, the fence is gone, that will actually be able to uh, help the Siberian Elms in their immediate soil area around them. Can I go ahead a slide, please? And that's the detail section through there. I'd like to point out uh, just in particular that the uh, the screen that you're seeing behind there is just the screen. It's not a fence. The the line there might look like there's a fence in section, but it's really just a uh, a screen running east west there. So you can see uh, in particular how the drainage is. Working. Slide, please. In the plan, you can see the areas of the hard service where we connect directly into Antler Avenue and the service areas that have the, uh, we have the, sorry, let me get to my slide so I can read it better. Um, so you have, you have the service yard, you have the um, service buildings just north of Antler Avenue and you have the hard service connecting to it. And then we have uh, the rafts, which you see dotting along there, which create those spaces for social interaction with benches and uh, all accessible from the, the mm -hmm. MUT and the secondary path running along the east, uh, east sorry, the west side uh, directly into Campbell Park along the line of the Siberian Elms. Um, and you see where the MUT is coming and crossing over the paved area. This is an area of mixing where we want to make sure that there's a kind of a slowing down of cyclists and understanding that there is a T intersection here that we're working with. Can I go ahead a slide, please? On DuPont Street, you can see we had the earlier section, uh, but now you can see sidewalks sloping up to the greenway and the existing roadway slo sloping down. So you can see the, the, I think again, the confluence of all those kind of planes, so the vertical planes, the horizontal planes, and of the, the bridge square happening at this point. This is really a, a key um, connection point of the, of the project. If you go ahead a slide, please. Now the other thing that's important on this slide, that's in this slide that's important to me is, is the uh, presence of the ramp uh, that's going up. This is a, a wide open ramp that will be very kind of uh, open to the sun, open to the skies. It'll be, um, I think, safe and um, people will have confidence using it. And you can see as you go up at the first level, just north of DuPont Street. This becomes a sort of a connection point from DuPont Bridge Square up to the, the up to the ramp those stairs become a kind of an interesting performance space the ramp goes up three layers basically of about 60 meters each the it's about it's three meters wide for each each leg of it and from the um from the north side of it on the right side of the screen you can see that you can actually see down the cp line and you can also look down down the whole length of the greenway so it's a really important spot uh, and you can see the switch on on <clears throat> pardon me on the left hand side of the bridge square where you have that circular space that will form a connection at some point to uh, the new developments that are happening to the west of the greenway right at DuPont here. You can go ahead a slide, please. Can we go ahead one more slide, please? Thank you. And that's a section looking north. So you can see the set of stairs that are leading up to that first landing of the ramp. Uh, and how that ramp is really, uh, really bright and wide open. I think it's a very important to have something that's uh, easy to use and something that is that you feel safe using. Um, could you go ahead another slide, please? Again, this is uh, this is uh, my last slide of the project, but again, it's showing that outdoor kind of urban room and the ramp of uh, far end of the 
drawing and how this space becomes a really important connector of the project. And one of the kind of termination points uh, before you go up and across the CN CP line. Can we go to the next slide, please? Our design schedule, um, stage one preliminary design. This is a work that you're seeing tonight, which is from the 25% um, preliminary design. We are now in the state in the 50 to 75%, which is going to take us into uh, early spring. And we're working on all of those connections, working on the grading, working on the civil designs and, and really uh, very highly integrated uh, design methodology between engineering, drainage, landscape, and the urban design elements. Our, uh, our This 2022 in time for a tender in the fall and a construction start in uh, the fall of 2023. Go ahead, another slide. Okay, I think I pass it off to Susan. Thank you. Okay, so we are very lucky with this project to have two elected officials or the elected officials so involved and have been from day one. Um, and so I, um, MPP Styles was, I think, fighting a couple of technical issues, as have we all at times in this, and is able to join us now. So I'm going to ask for some brief remarks from um, MPP Styles at this time, and then we'll go right into questions, I promise. Cross my heart. Dan, Paul or Daniel, are you able to unmute our MPP? I can't. Um, no, I can't, but can you? I'm sorry, technical issues don't seem to be limited to you, MPP. They seem to be ours as well. Sorry? And I've tried to unmute her as well and can't seem to. We'll work on this. I'm so sorry. I am absolutely so sorry. Um, but uh, let's see if I can do it over here. No, I can't. I'm sorry. And I'm not the technical whiz. So apologies. Um, we will work on this and we'll try to, to make it work by the end. Um, yes? Okay, so uh, Colin, if you can reach out to Paul, because I have to start asking questions. And as soon as we get you unmuted, MPP, then we'll, we'll uh, go back to your remarks. I apologize for this. First question um, from the uh, from the um, questions that were on uh, on the uh, presentation that's been up for a couple of weeks, um, and it's got the most votes by far. Where are the swings, dog park, play area, graffiti coding, etc.? This rendering is missing much of what was originally promised to the community. Will there be swings and a play area for king, kids, dog park, wooden seating areas, tables, graffiti coating on pillars, or metal cladding on the pedestrian bridge at DuPont? So why don't we start with John to answer this, please? Okay, and thank you, Susan. So um, to answer your question, uh, yeah, when we, I'll answer it in four parts. The first part is what's happened to the swings, play areas, tables, et cetera. Um, uh, some of those elements will, versions of those elements will probably be in the detailed design, but in truth, a lot of those elements are duplicating amenities that are provided in adjacent parks. And really, as the, as the scheme's being developed uh in more detail we're not just looking at the guideway project as a standalone piece but we're looking at it as how it connects with works with supports and is supported by the adjacent public parks particularly campbell park and aaron cricken park as for um you also asked about adola we have we are providing an area for 
a future dog park and we're um, starting discussions with the city of Toronto around the maintenance agreement that would be required to implement the dog park. So uh, you can follow either, you can keep following us or talk to the counselor for updates on the DOLA, which is a short form for dog off leash areas. And finally, graffiti management. I'm gonna take a minute because there are, graffiti is a question or that has come up again and again. And sorry, I've just got a, my cat is very insistent that he wants to be part of this meeting. Um, graffiti management has come up again and again throughout the question. So I'm gonna de go over it in a little detail here. And then um, I will sort of respond in, in less detail when it comes up in subsequent questions. So as for graffiti um, management, Metrolinx, believe it or not, does has developed some pretty sophisticated protocols, and they're not so different than the city of Toronto has. As you know, graffiti is a massive problem in this city, and it's it's con managing it and deterring it has become probably the single biggest design challenge we face here at Metrolinx. So when we talk about managing graffiti, one of you know it's really two parts. How do we deter graffiti? And then how do we manage it? Deterrent strategies include the application of graffiti resistant coatings or protectants as they're called. You know, you've seen throughout the city murals have been used as a way of deterring graffiti. Landscape and vegetation adjacent to vulnerable surfaces or vines, as many, this is a suggestion that's come up again and again, is another graffiti deterrent. So is restricting access to walls or vulnerable areas, and that can be done through a number of strategies, including fencing or, or um, uh, you know, vine screens, etc. And the big one, which people don't understand, increased lighting. And of course, we have to balance that against the sort of counter um, requirement that we minimize light trespass, especially at uh, you know, after 9 or 11 p.m. So then we turn to graffiti management protocols that Metrolinx has in place, and some of them are a kind of a reiteration of the deterrent strategies. We, like the city of Toronto, we often apply pigmented coatings to surfaces, sometimes up up to a certain height, and that uh, that strategy, the way we manage graffiti is as it's tagged, we overpaint. Um, we we aim to have uh, a color match to the overpainting, and that is that is a very standard ma you know graffiti management technique used all across the city, but used by municipalities and tra transit agencies across North America. Another one is clear anti-graffiti coatings. These are silicone-based coatings that deter you know you know stop greedy you know graffiti from you know adhering permanently to a surface it is you know it, it's proven to be not entirely effective we've done a lot of tests a lot of tests uh, across our network but more specifically for this project we've we've been doing multiple testings at our site down our our yard just off of Lansdowne. And what we found is the the amount of labor it required you know required isn't commensurate with the with the um, outcome. We, we, you know, the process requires the application of chemicals and then power washing those chemicals and removing the traces of the graffiti. And that requires having a water source, you know, close by or access to a water source, and the use of some pretty um, toxic chemicals. So we we tend to shy away from this because the benefits are not really commensurate with the level of effort or disbenefits. And finally, murals. Um, we've, ha we have a history of working with the city of Toronto on this, where murals can be used to deter coatings. You know, Kim, it's, uh, you know, a little later on, we'll probably talk to you a little about, you know, what are we, can we use murals in the Davenport Diamond Guideway project as one of our de graffiti deterrent strategies that also kind of, you know, works as part of our, you know, basically allows the community to express themselves through community art or public art. So anyway, we have this range of options and, you know, 
in subsequent questions, I will just talk about specific responses. There's a lot of questions about using vines on our our retaining structures or retaining walls along the corridor, and we'll address that later. So apologies for how long and involved this uh, response was, but I think it sets the, it'll answer about 12 questions down the road. Okay, so let's see if Paul has joined us and if we can, I've reached out to him and I think Colin has reached out to him and I think he has power we don't. Paul? We'll keep trying MPP, I promise. I'm sorry about this. And I muted myself just as I was going on to the next question. Cycling connections to DuPont. Will the ramps to DuPont be designed to accommodate cyclists as well as pedestrians? This is an important connection, given, uh, especially given that there will be no access to happen. Uh, Kim, if you want yes, to start you, us Stephen. off. Yeah, um, the, the sidewalks on the south side of DuPont are being connected as ramp going up to the greenway it is not a cycling ramp and cyclists will have to dismount this is this is a standard approach for ramps and sidewalks across the city so um, I think it still gives us the ability to take your your bikes up there but you'd have to dismount to do it uh, I don't know if uh, John wanted to speak to that as well anything Deb? Okay, let's move on to the connectivity with Bloor and the West Toronto Rail Path. Are there plans, and my dog, who got excited about the dog park idea. Are there plans in the works to connect uh, the Davenport Diamond Greenway with the West Toronto Rail Path and with the Bloor bike lanes? The current proposal doesn't show anything south of Bloor, nor how people will access the trail. John Potter. Yeah, yes, and uh, at the beginning at the start of the the open house the councillor spoke about this connection so yes it is happening it's just why you're not seeing it in this presentation is this is about the Davenport Diamond Greenway project the extension of the Maltese Trail south of Wade Avenue across Bloor and then down to the Toronto West Toronto Rail Path extension is part of the Bloor Lansdowne Go Station project, which is um, currently um, moving into design. That's a smart track project, and but Metrolinx is committed to create making that connection south from Wade of all the way to the West Toronto Rail Path extension. Thank you. Paul, have we got you? Sorry. How will the project affect Davenport Village Park? The explanation provided is unclear in terms of how the construction will affect the Davenport Village Park and the surrounding community. From the little information available, it seems like it would um, be immensely detrimental in terms of noise, visual pollution, and security. So, Kim and Josh. Yeah. Um Absolutely, I'm working on getting at least two uh, connections that are at grade, so you don't have to take steps or ramp up, so that uh, from the um, multi-use trail that is coming down, it is is coming down from going over the CP rail line and down into the park. And now we have to also kind of develop our, our grading plan so that we can get those connections working at a level uh, at a level landings. So we're working on that right now. We also have to do some property sort of negotiations to be able to jump over from uh, the City of Toronto lands at uh, Davenport Village Park onto have a final design yet to show, but that will definitely become part of the next presentation at the public level. Yeah, and I just might I might add to what to Kim's response that if helpful, uh, if they're going to be a, a series of questions about connections, it might be good to pull up 
that context map again so you can see uh, where these connections exist. And, and as Kim said, there will be a connection um, to Downport Triangle Park. And that's, um, it's not sort of visualized on the map, but it is part of the next phase of work. The, I think the construction question will will hand off um, to someone from the Metrolinx team. I think Kent was going to answer that question around construction impacts to Davenport Channel Park. Sorry, in terms of, of noise, we do have as part of the elevated guideway project, noise walls that will continue and extend down past the park location. Um, that, that is all part of the elevated guideway project. The connections for the multi-use trail will be at a higher elevation where they meet and connect into the existing pathway in the park. That work would take place, access would be from the corridor side in all likelihood and be limited to just those connection locations with minimal impacts to the park itself. Thanks, Kent. Will there be a connection to Earl's Court Park? One of the beautiful things about the West Toronto Rail Path is that it creates a safe route for cyclists and pedestrians to cross major streets via bridges. This path ends abruptly at Davenport, I think. Um, it would be wonderful to span Davenport to encourage future north or northward expansion of this trail and safer, safer passage to Earl's Court Park. John. Okay, so um, a, a bridge connection to Earl's Court Park is, we did do an EA for this um, as part of the Bloor Lansdowne GO station, but it is not currently within scope and there's actually a very good reason for it. Um, and that is because of the, hy the hydro lines running above, it's not feasible to have a pedestrian bridge going under them that's even closer to the lines than the pathways at grade. But, you know, they're, that same hydro corridor that creates a, a barrier to, you know, to putting a bridge connecting tr the Maltese Trail to Earl's Court Park directly does open an opportunity up for a connection to another uh, multi-use trail system that's currently being developed by the city of Toronto called the Green Line Toronto. And this project of which I don't have a lot of details, the councillor may have more, uh, is, a pro is planned to be approximately five kilometres in length and will utilise this very same hydroelectric corridor to create a uh, active transportation link, more or less running um, in a east-west direction, though it does come south as well. So um, the answer to the Earls Court bridge connection is no, but the Davenport Diamond multi-use trail system, the objective is for it to connect to the Green Line Park if it goes forward. And um, as I say, the councillor can speak to that in her closing remarks if she wants. We are trying. Add, John, oh. It is going forward. We're actually building the first portion of it next year, um, Gary. Um, but we're not giving up this connection, just by the way. Let me put it this way. We still think that Metrolink still should do it. But we'll continue the conversations. Okay, I'm, um, so we are still trying to reach our digital team. I have massive numbers of, of uh, um, apologies to our MPP because I have no idea how to help you because I am the least digitally um, technical person here, but we are trying to reach them to the point we're actually even phoning. Um, I'm going to switch over for a couple of questions on the 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 page that uh, that this presentation is on, so that we aren't ignoring that, and then we'll go to the Zoom room. What will it look and sound like from Davenport Village Park? None of the renderings show this area. What will prevent residents from a constant train noise? So I can answer that question. Um, <laughs> 
What will it sound like? The same noise and vibration studies that were undertaken for the guideway south of the CP rail and in along the elevated guideway apply here. As Kent said earlier, that um, we are providing continuous noise barriers, and you know, facing uh, Davenport Village Park. The visual impacts are a little different than uh, south of the CP rail corridor because the we have the corridor coming down to what you would call grade at the same time as the city, you know, the the grade level is sloping up as it approaches the old Lake Iroquois shoreline. So in fact, the guideway, is, you know, it reaches grade much more quickly than south of CP rail tracks. Needless to say, it'll, it will not be as visually prominent from the park as the park in some places is at a higher elevation and you will still, you know, get a view. You will see the MSC wall. There'll be vegetation in the foreground, Maltese Trail, MSC wall, and then you will see the the special cladding that is being placed on the noise wall all along the the guideway project. Okay, John, don't go far. Recent steps towards complete the Antler Lapin connection. The community was disappointed to see the Antler Lapin foot connection dropped from the boards without explanation. Both MPP Styles and Deputy Mayor Valau have written to Metrolinx to encourage um, you to move forward with this. What steps have you taken in the last two months to ensure this connection is built? So I'm not gonna give the answer anyone likes, but it is the answer that um, is, though we are absolutely committed to increasing connectivity, you know, up and down the multi-use trail. But at this point, a connection to Lapin Avenue is not in the current scope of the work. There's you know, no plans today to connect, you know, make the connection over privately owned land. And you know, if in the future there's a development proposal put forward by the the land the landowners or the owners of the parking lot that you know currently you know act as a barrier between our property and Lappin Avenue. If they choose to, you know, put in a, a development proposal, the city does have tools to, um, you know, have, you know, encourage them or make them create that connection. But as of, you know, right now, no, there's no current plans in our scope to make that connection. We have always maintained though, that we, once the, the greenways finished that we expect you know a plethora of new connections to be made you know over time um we've got a question about overnight noise is there an expectation that this project will require overnight construction i think kent this may be you as ken is saying oh no more sure. overnight noise questions in my life yeah. Um, no, I, I don't. Uh, I don't expect there to be a need to to do any overnight work uh, as part of this project. Uh, when this project starts, the train traffic will be on the elevated guideway. Um, so for the most part, all the work can happen during regular daytime hours. Uh, there, there, there may be uh, some work around CP and in installation of the for the pedestrian bridge that may require a night or two, but for the most part, it will be all daytime work. That's the expectation at this point. Thank you. And we have MPP Styles um, back, and I'm not showing you you um, as, as uh, on mute, so hopefully. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, we can. We can, yay. <laughs> All right. Well, I just uh, logged back out and logged back in again, and miraculously, here we are. Anyways, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, uh, say I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to be allowed into the meeting uh, when everybody else was, and that I wasn't um, able to unmute for some reason. But uh, I am, uh, for those of <laughs> and now you'll hear my dog in the background. Um, for those of you who may not know, perhaps, or maybe new to the area, I'm Marit Stiles, your member of Provincial Parliament for Davenport, and uh, I want to thank you in advance for spe spending your evening with us. Uh, I also want to thank Deputy B Mayor Bailao, because I think she took us through a bit of this uh, early on. I wasn't 
able to enter the meeting at that point. So I don't know what she uh, what she went through, but I'm sure she gave you a good background. Um, I was a community member uh, during many of these conversations uh, early on before I was elected, either even as a, a school board trustee. Um, you know, and I think everybody who's here knows that our community is defined by trains and rails. It's part of our daily lives. Um, and so we know here in Davenport all too well the value and the importance of those rails and the role we all play in our community in terms of increasing um, access to, to transit, uh, which is very important for our city. I, it's part of our daily lives. But we also know that our families, and we've known this for years, would be impacted in a very significant way when construction began, and we know that it has been. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's been involved in those community liaison committee meet meetings and also uh, all the staff and everyone who's been working together because, you know, it has had a, it's, it's had a very detrimental impact on a lot of people who live close to the rails. Uh, construction has been noisy and difficult for many, many people. Uh, and I want to say, you know, we've had quite a bit of luck organizing around those issues in the community to, to bring um, people together uh, and make sure that Metrolinx knew that we weren't messing around, that we needed uh, to be listened to as a community, uh, and that it wasn't acceptable that people couldn't sleep all night. So we've had some success, and then it's kind of come back again, and we've 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 had a, uh, ins and outs. Uh, I want to thank my staff person um, in my constituency office, Peter Gaddy, who's been attending every single meeting and raising all these issues on your behalf. But I think the really important thing I want to say before, and I won't go on at great length, because a lot of issues have already been raised in those questions. But, you know, this is, and I think those folks who are involved in the early days of this project know this more than anyone else. This is an important initiative, but it's also an important city building initiative. And that perspective needs to be central to this. And I never believed, uh, as a, a community member, when it was negotiations were happening between various governments and Metrolinks and the community, that it was enough to just say, here's the quid pro quo for pumping more dirty diesel trains through your neighborhood and building this giant bridge in your backyard. You know, here's here's something. I mean, for me, it's really about creating those connections, creating those pathways, um, those opportunities for more interaction, for more social integration, for more, again, pathways, connections. I mean, this is the opportunity we have here. And I think many people in our community, you know, did see it that way and continue to. And over the last few months, my team and, um, and volunteers I've been working with have been working in the community to make sure that we were hearing from you what your concerns might be and bringing those forward to Metrolinx. And I, I want to say, I think it's really important we keep doing that. Um, this meeting is a really important one, and I think everybody who's participating in it tonight. Um, I met a couple of weeks ago with CEO Phil Verster, uh, the CEO of, of Metrolinx. You can go to my website and see some of the correspondence there. My my emails to him, the responses back, etc. Uh, I would say we're still working on some some sticky issues, in particular things that community members have raised, and I want to just reiterate them. Although I think they did come up in in many of the questions. One of them is, you know, the question that a lot of people have about transparency and accountability and better communications with Metrolinx. Um, why are there inconsistencies with earlier renderings of the project and what has changed and why? And again, I, I appreciate some of the responses we got tonight, but I know that they won't answer all your questions. So, you know, please uh, email me, my go to my website, email me, call me. And we'll continue to raise those issues uh, throughout this process. Um, I know there's questions about the, in particular, about the antler lapin connection, which kind of disappeared. <laughs> it was in some plans and then seemed to disappear. And we are getting rather different um, responses from Metrolinx about what happened there. And I want you to know that that was a major focus of, of my conversation with the CEO and, and, uh, Deputy Mayor Bailao and I have raised this separately, to, but also together, um, because it's a major concern for us. And then, you know, overnight noise. Are there other connections also at risk? And finally, what is the actual timing of electrification? Because if, in fact, electrification doesn't start when the new stations open or when the, the those those trains start coming through our neighborhood on the bridge, 
we know that that means a lot more dirty diesel coming through and all the greenery and all the beauty and all the pathways and connections. Well, you know, it, it's going to be it's going to be different if it's diesel versus electric. So I wanted to raise those issues here. Uh, know that we are listening to that and very conscious of this and um, and working really hard uh, on your behalf and uh, and working together, you know, with with Metrolinx, with the city, with with uh, Councillor Bailao and Deputy Mayor Bailao um, and my team. So come to me, call me, email me. We will keep raising these issues. Uh, I see this as an ongoing initiative that requires all of our attention and focus. And thank you very much for the chance to speak. Sorry for the delay and um, on that, but I'm glad that, that it finally worked. Um, the we've got to go over to the Zoom room now. So we'll go to Colin Burns, my colleague that is hanging out in the Zoom room with, I don't know, I would call you Zoomers, but not so much. Let's go. Thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, we just have one question that was written in by Bruno. Um, said, thank you for taking questions. Uh, during Kim Story's presentation, there was an issue with the audio when she was mentioning the connection points, specifically a comment made regarding Davenport Village Park. Could that please be repeated slash clarified? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, sorry for the uh, technical difficulty. Um, I believe I would have been talking about how we are currently working on the design to create two level connection points at least uh, from the, uh, the MUT sort of ramp as it's coming down as, as John was just describing. It's a fairly complicated little grading exercise that we're working uh, very diligently uh, consulting to develop um, a grading plan and a point where we can make a connection right uh, over to to uh, Davenport Village Park at, at at least two points and that will also be accompanied by a ramp connection at the end of uh, the Greenway where we meet Davenport Road. So we're trying to create as many connection points as we can along there. There is a, a property development that we also have to look at because while Davenport Village Park is City of Toronto land, there's a small sliver of land that is actually a Gabion wall, which is part of the crash barrier construction. So we'd have to find an easement to get us over that to make that connection. So there's a you know some details to work out, but it's definitely common. Colin, back over to you. If, do we have any hands up or any other questions or else we'll go back to our questions list because we do have more. Um, I do have a question. Sorry, um, Andrew uh, stated he asked a question yeah. before the Zoom room was live. So uh, I don't know if he wants to um, type his question out, but um, maybe come back to me um, after a question. Okay, so I'll move over to why is there so much exposed cement? The area is rife with graffiti. Why are the columns and benches made of cement? This building material is just about the worst thing you could use here. John Potter, do you want okay. to talk cement? Yes, and um, I would love to have Waleed and Kent on here, but I will talk. I mean, the simple, f the choice of cement is because of its long-term durability and it, you know the fact that it minimizes long-term maintenance. It's also, um, the ideal building material for these kind of uh, elevated guideways. We're we're using similar uh, a similar construction strategy for the other guideways, and there, you know, it's a structural choice, and it's it's also a durability choice. Now you talk about um, graffiti. I spoke at length about graffiti management, and part of it is we do definitely, as I said earlier, we have a pretty sophisticated. Uh, graffiti management um, got, or we have graffiti management guidelines, but we are also going to be working with the Brown and Story team to see, you know, what is the most appropriate response in this for this project based on the design that they're developing right now. So it's not, you know, the Davenport Diamond Greenway and Guideway project is not going to get an off-the-shelf graffiti management solution. I mean, we have a range of options, but we will be working with Brown and Story to figure out 
the best option for this particular project? Yes, and one of the, uh, I think one of the exciting possibilities here is uh, is to look at the murals as a as a real positive addition. Um, we also like the idea of using vine planting, although I know there is the issue of being able to inspect the structure, so that may not be a go, but certainly with uh, the murals, uh, we think there's a real win-win possibility here for uh, working with a community group to be able to uh, create a mural program um, that can really bring some uh, art to to the art to the greenway and bring some a whole new level of, of cooperation and ownership of the greenway for the community. I'm we're really hoping that's something that could uh, get jump started and maybe tonight's the night that could happen. So that's Thanks. a program that we'd also um, be working with the city as well, right? When we're talking about mural programs, et cetera. Yes, John? Um, yeah, there's, well, there's two ways of working with on mural programs. Like what Kim's talking about is, you know, responding to some of the community, you know, interest in, in art and also how, um, you know, murals can be used to help as a, you know, provide multiple benefits, including graffiti management. But the city does have a program. It's called Street Art Toronto. It's an amazing program. We have had meetings with Street Art Toronto. We just don't have anything concrete to, re to report at this time. Um, I do know that that program, there's a huge demand on their resources. And by resources, I'm not talking money. I'm actually talking staff. And so, you know, they're not, you know, we may be moving forward with our own programs, but yes, we've already started discussions, but we, we're going to obviously continue these conversations. Okay, community consultation ideas. Is there an opportunity to incorporate the ideas from the community consultations? All the public art is gone, plus the seating, plus the seating and gathering spaces. This is kind of like some of the others. Proper lighting is a huge concern for safety at night. I know Metrolink's team wanted all of this too. What are some of the steps to get back there? Kim, it strikes me that some of this is some of the stuff you've been speaking about. It's really important for our planners that we are creating those places for sitting and, and socializing and they are um, really set within a, a very large garden and um, we're very pleased with the patterning that's happening now in the design plan. Um, and I think uh, those things are happening. I hope we'll have more, you know, more information uh, as we move into this detailed design phase very shortly that we can share with the public again. Uh, what we wanted to show in those views Oops. to sit and the lighting. Lighting is, is very important to us. As well. Yeah, uh, just to pick up on what Kim said, what you haven't seen yet is, is sort of progress on the lighting design and in with respect to community consultation ideas. Um, Josh, had, he started off the sort of the presentation on the on the Greenway project with their kind of design drivers. And as you know, all actually almost, in fact, I think all of those de design drivers come from recommendations that came out of the residence reference panel, but also years of consultation with the community. So actually community consultation basically is the DNA of everything you see today. Now, I've been remiss. Colin, I totally ditched you. I ditched the Zoom room. I didn't mean to. I got on a roll. That's okay. I did, I did get the question from Andrew. Um, okay. So the question is, can pedestrian access of the guideway be open in completed areas while other areas are still being constructed? That would be I'm thinking Kent. Kent. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's a difficult uh, question to answer because we don't yet know exactly how the, the project will be staged. Uh, that could be a possibility uh, depending on the, the contractor and, and where they, they want to uh, where they want to start. Um, I suspect there'll be some areas that will 
uh, require more more time and effort to to build like the pedestrian bridge over CP. While there may be areas that could be constructed quicker and faster, like the MUT south of Wallace. So I think uh, until we get further along with the design and the details, we won't we won't really have an answer there. But it's certainly a possibility. Well, that's good news. Uh, um, speaking of all these wonderful plants, which are very cool, I was making notes. Um, what is the long-term maintenance plan for the plantings? Who will manage the long-term um, care for the landscaping? I'm, I'm asking our spectacular landscapers. Thanks so much. Um, so, so. Um, one of the, the 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 key issues with this kind of landscape, it it, the, it it's not maintained the same way as a conventional park space, and um, I like to think of it as more of a managed landscape. So there's some critical activities that have to be done. First, we have to make sure that there's no invasive plants um, that are taking over um, the landscaping, um, and and two. We, we have to make sure that there's nothing that that's dangerous. So so pr something that anything that makes you itchy or or um, has prickly thorns on it. So that aspect is is usually done with sort of an annual kind of of, of cutting, um, and that work would be done by MetroLink within the right of way. Um, the plant materials there. Um, the 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 other thing um, about this landscape is as it's being constructed, um, the the contractor that's awarded the contract to 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 build the greenway will re be responsible initially for getting that landscape established so that when it's completed and handed over to MetroLink to to um, maintain, it's a thriving landscape at that point. Excellent. Okay, so we have a few questions um, about why this and that isn't depicted. And I think that it's already been explained that there is a very defined project here. And the whole Davenport area has got a lot of different projects to, to before we get to fruition. So part of it can be um, from the Smart Track station at Fleur Lansdowne, part of it, um, you know, so, so generally that's usually um one and there's actually a public affairs or there's a community engagement question here um that i'll start and then i will uh, i'll call on kent but it said could a rendering be provided showing the catenary wires the overhead electrical wires will be another important visual cue along the entire stretch so i'll start this out kent and then you pick it up but um the uh, Davenport Diamond grade separation and the scope of the project is does is one portion of what we're doing with Go Expansion. There's another big portion that's going to follow called the Encore project, and that is where electrification is coming from. So we wouldn't show those uh, designs in current um, in current um, um, renderings. So uh, Kent, correct me or add or whatever if you want. Yes, uh, you're you're right. Uh, you're correct. The the elevated guideway project does include provisions for electrification. We are uh, constructing all of the the pole bases for the catenary system. Uh, that includes the pole bases both on the guideway itself as well as the MSC wall areas to the north and south. So when the Encore project does come on board and it's time to install those poles and those wires, uh, everything along this portion of the guideway will be essentially ready to go. Um, that includes grounding and bonding at the structure locations and the conduit runs that are needed. So we're, uh, we're definitely going to be in, in good shape to, to take on that work when the time comes. I believe we did have a rendering at one point uh, going back a couple of years ago, I think now showing what that catenary system would look like on the elevated guideway, and I think we could uh, we could find that that rendering again and and provide that as a a bit of a, a snapshot of what that would look like some point down the road. 
This and is why I check with the project delivery team. Can I just add one last point? So I had the great, you know, I had the benefit of working on uh, on Go expansion and the electrification project. And because I was on Davenport, I, I use that link. Um, so in the electrification specifications, this, well, the specifications for the whole electrification project, um, I was able to make sure that there is reference to the Davenport Diamond Elevated Guideway. And I made sure that we have a slightly um, enhanced spec for the, the overhead catenary support system for this one project. Okay, I'm going to do one more question and then, well, no, we actually, I'll do one more quick one, okay? I'll try to make it quick and you guys try to give me a quick answer so that we can um, get some final comments and then, um, and then, oh, we're going to um, shut down. Um, the green wall, given the Tetris style building blocks of the north and south MSE wall, what considerations are being made to turn this into a green wall. Ivy would easily and quickly grow in the cracks and would significantly enhance the aesthetic appeal and otherwise blunt the mundane wall. It would also act as a deterrent to the inevitable tagging. Okay, so I'll just pick this up. Uh, you know, you actually, uh, in your question, you pointed out the very reason we can't put plant vegetation on the, we call them, MSC walls, but the Tetris grid walls that you refer to, because in fact, the those walls have to be, you know, open for vis visual inspections, regular visual inspections. And in fact, being able to make out the relationship of the of the, each of the panels with, you know, relative to each other is an important aspect of that that uh, visual inspection. But that said, so no, we unfortunately we we cannot plant vines on these walls or create you know vertical green walls. But always remember that you're not you're not just seeing a wall. A the wall is a custom design. Those panels were specially designed for this project. It's not the off the shelf design that you see on all the 400 series highways. It is going to have a a you know whether it's a pigmented coating or something along the lines of what Kim was talking about, about a mural program, that is something that we're, we'll be talking about and working on. And remember, when you're riding or walking along the Maltese Trail, you the, the wall is not the only thing you see. You're looking forward, you're seeing vegetation on one side, you're seeing, you know, you come up very quickly on different things like the Patton Road underpass, which is going to be quite, um, I think, is a really nice feature of, of that, the, uh, you know, berm sections of the guideway. And, you know, once the, the guideway has been open, you will start to have amenities showing up in the buildings that are running along the east side of, of the corridor, especially in the employment lands between Wade and and Wallace, and probably up all the way up to Antler, and the C, you know, so there's going to be a lot to look at. But yes, we cannot um, we cannot plant vine structures or other vegetation on those retaining walls. Okay, so Daniel, our official tech guy, we're going to hang in here for a few extra minutes because I'm going to ask the deputy mayor and the MPP if they have any. Um, Closing comments, and I do not want them cut off, please. Um, Deputy Mayor? Or MPP Styles? Okay, I can, I can oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Anna, go ahead. I, I, I just want to thank everybody for being here as everybody can see there's still a lot of details that are being worked on. I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is reassuring to see um, this work being done. There was some anxiety for, by, the, by the fact that this was that the, this was not tendered at the same time as uh, as the bridge. So the work has begin, began. Uh, there are some components that are clearly very important for the community, as we heard by some of the questions, the connections, the dog off leash, some of the the 
work that had been done before, honestly. I think that a lot of people are feeling that a lot of work had been done and here we are again redesigning the whole thing again. Um, but this is more of a detailed design, um, but it's clear there are really important aspects of uh, the work that had been done before that people want to see as the design moves forward. And uh, you can rest assured that uh, I know that, uh, that that is quite important and uh, I will be voicing those, uh, those aspirations, those concerns, uh, the vision that we had uh, to make sure that once shovels get on the ground, uh, it is something that, uh, that we all worked together to, to achieve. And uh, like I said at the beginning, that is gonna be a great improvement for the community and something that we'll be proud of. Okay, MPP. Thank you very much. And uh, following on what Anna said, I mean, I think there were lots of good questions raised here. And I've been, as I mentioned earlier, speaking to folks in the community about what questions they had and trying my best to answer some of them as we, as we learned more. Uh, and it, it is clear that there are a lot of people, and I'm sure there will still be people with lots of questions about this redesign. And I think it's fair to say there was, as Anna put it, there were concerns, um, certainly. Um, but I think this is an important opportunity. Uh, it's why we're all participating tonight, because we know that there's an opportunity here uh, for us to to create a project that I think, to be fair to everyone here, is, is really not an, an opportunity that comes up very often, which is why I think our community is really engaged and has always been very engaged. It's not just about trying to avoid the negatives like the diesel trains and the big bridge. It's also about trying to leverage some of this into opportunities that we might not get for generations. So having those pathways, those connections, that green space, those opportunities to connect communities, um, it's, it's extraordinarily important and it, it doesn't come up very often. And that's why we'll continue to work, I think, together, Anna and I and, um, and Metro, you know, with Metrolinks and the community to try to find as many opportunities as we can here. So uh, this is, I hope, the beginning of a conversation. I want to thank everybody uh, who participated tonight and everybody at Metrolinks for for being here to answer some of those questions and to uh, uh, to mention again that we will. This is an ongoing uh, process. That's one thing I've learned. Uh, certainly uh, in the last few years is, is an ongoing conversation and we have lots of opportunity to continue to to feed in and also you know put pressure and organize around issues that we think as a community are super important so thank you again everybody i want to thank our panel tonight i want to thank our elected officials i want to thank all the people who've done some really excellent work on this project i think it's going to be a beautiful space i look forward to future updates from our talented designers and um, be it um, you know, be it our plant designers or our, our um, ambiance and all of these things. This one, this one's really cool. This is a lot of fun. Um, I want to ask everybody to stay safe and have really, truly um, happy holidays. Get your booster shot if you get a chance and, um, and take care. If you have any questions, you can reach us. There's all kinds of ways on Metrolinks Engage and there's phone numbers and all this kind of stuff that we'll make sure is available to you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your participation.